Now, Gail Shi, in your most recent work, New Passages, uh, you've documented a, a revolution in the adult life cycle where adulthood itself uh, is apparently delayed it's up to a decade compared to in times past. How has this come about? Well, it's, a, it's partly the longevity revolution. I mean, people are living much, much longer. They're taking longer to grow up and much, much longer to die. I mean, I remember the, uh, the head of a, a nursing home in the States told me that uh, just two decades ago, she used to have 60-year-olds, 40-year-olds uh, bringing in their 60-year-old parents. Now she has 60-year-olds bringing in their 90-year-old parents. But aging unto itself just suggests that we've got a longer time or to be old people. Uh, you're suggesting something, something very, very different. Quite that, different. That, that first it's taking a lot longer to become an adult. You have 30-year-olds who are living at home, and I'm 43 years old. I really don't think I'm an adult yet, or I'm just kind of getting to getting to there. Is this is this the narcissism of youth that uh, the baby boomers have been so much the focus of everything that we refuse to get old? Well, the baby boomers did things on a delay. You know, most mm -hmm. people in 20 years ago used to form their families, make pretty serious career commitments, uh, start having children in their 20s, and by their 30s they were ready to maybe redirect, or they were locked in. Um, this generation, you know, is still having babies in their 40s, uh, and and some of them looking forward to possibly delaying until their 50s and using technology to have uh, later children. So um, you see, at the same time, men being retired in their 50s, mm -hmm. something they never counted on. Um, you see women starting first professional degrees in their 60s or going back to college in their 60s or 70s or 80s even in, uh, in Canada. Um, you see men having um, reversals of aging through taking human growth hormone, even though it's very experimental. You see people running in marathons in their 80s. Um, you see people getting remarried in their 80s and scandalizing their middle-aged children. Um, so you have to say, what's going on here? All these age norms are no longer normative. Mm -hmm. um, and as I began to look at it and study and sift through hundreds of interviews and surveys, what I began to see is that we have shifted all the stages ahead by about 10 years. So that 50 is what 40 used to be, and 60 is what 50 used to be. So when boomers reject the whole concept of middle age, you know, who, me? No way. They're right, because our concept of middle age does not fit them in mm -hmm. their 40s and early 50s. But I wonder, I mean, it's, is it, you know, you look at a lot of the icons now. I mean, Mick Jagger said, I'll never sing Satisfaction when I'm over 50, and is doing that, you know, in Bangkok today, probably, Absolutely. at the age of, of 53. I mean, all our role models have grown older, too. Well, you know, that's right. But, you know, if so many of those uh, celebrities in their mid to late 40s kind of went into a little death. I mean, a lot of them pulled out of the public eye. I mean, Tina Turner said, I can't be a rock and roll old woman. And the next thing you know, she's out on tour at 52 or 53, shaking and rattling. Doing and better than ever Doing before. better than ever. Um, you've got Dolly Parton turning 50 years old, Susan Sarandon, who had a child at 45. You know, so we're all having to reconfigure the maps in our minds, which is why I called the, uh, the subtitle of the book, Mapping Your Life Across mm -hmm. Time. Because you actually have to stop and recalculate and say, let's see, 45, that's the old age of my first adulthood. And then 50 becomes the youth of your second adulthood. And it requires a whole new dream, set of goals, questions like, who do I want to share this second adulthood with? Do I want to be remarried or stay married? Mm -hmm. or uh, Am I prepared to go it alone? Um, who will be my companions in this stage of life? What adventures can I try now that, you know, I've put a lot of obligations behind me? Um, how long do I want to live? And how much am I prepared to, to put into that? What kind of health practices and self-education and risks? Well, you've, you've called this middle essence, this notion that there is a, almost a second adolescent. And you're very optimistic. Yes. about this, which runs very contrary to a lot of the conventional wisdom. I mean, a, a number of conventional wisdoms, the first among them is that, you know, the future belongs to youth. Well, what you're saying is that, no, the future can belong to these middle-aged people who get this second uh, revival. What does that mean for youth? I mean, is, are there opportunities for their little day in the sun forever going to be blocked out by this big generation that is going through these Peter Pan periods almost? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, first of all, one good thing is that they don't have as uh, uh, inflated expectations as the baby boom had. And that will stand them in good stead mm -hmm. because what they 
find in their 30s and 40s, you know, will be more commensurate with what their aspirations actually were. You call them the endangered generation. Now they have been the endangered generation, and they've taken on this kind of, you know, mask of indifference. Their motto seems to be, whatever, you know, fire me, whatever, you know, grunge clothes and mm -hmm. steel-toed boots and... Uh, and I think that's all a mask because I think they're just as uh, aspirational um, as young people always were. But they are being blocked longer into getting into important entry-level positions, partly because the baby boom is in the way and has so many more people in, uh, in middle management, um, but also because the economy has been shrinking mm -hmm. and the uh, standard of living has been lowering. And Right. Over the last 20 years, the men in every age group, except those over 65 in the states anyway, as a group, have, have either been stagnant or declined in uh, wages. Well, I, and this is one of the things that struck me in your optimism. I mean, the other, again, conventional wisdom that it kind of takes on is that, you know, we're, we're in, a, in a period of time where a lot of our traditional values have been uprooted. This is a time of massive dislocations. Absolutely. I could lose my job at the age of 45 with no prospect of, of reemployment in what I was doing before. That's I mean, right. that's kind of a scary scenario, yet you're painting one that says this could be the, the time of your life, middle-aged Americans, North right. Americans. Well, you know, uh, heretofore, men particularly had been you know, in first adulthood, they knew exactly where they were going. The tracks were made for them. They knew just where they were, what stop they were at. And, uh, and they often, you know, capped off a lot of the emotional uh, tributaries and didn't have an awful lot of opportunity for connecting with other people, with uh, real intimacy with wives or, or real quality time with children. And then they get to middle life, and they be kind of stuck, and they just sort of plateau and then kind of coast mm -hmm. until retirement. Well, now, not only is that not so satisfying because you don't have the same challenge, the same excitement, you're not, it's not you up against the world anymore, but now you're really threatened with unemployment or being downsized, more responsibility for less money. So you can look at that as a, a real negative and, and uh, it, it does add insecurities, but you can also say the secret for everybody in making a second adulthood a satisfying, exciting time of life is to shake things up, is to try to find out what's the meaning in your life. You know, we all in our first adulthood develop a kind of false self to please the people we need to please. Mm -hmm. We need to please uh, teachers and bosses and mentors and mates. And we all do that. There's nothing wrong with it. But then you get to somewhere in your mid-40s or a little later and say, well, what does it mean, what am I doing? You know, how important is it? Does it really express my values? And, uh, and is there another medium of expression that I have neglected that's really important, that I can't avoid, that I have to do now. Well, you, you do acknowledge in, in the book, though, that, that men are not dealing with this change, this second adolescence, quite as well as, as women that's are. Right. And that also is, is contrary to a lot of our notions. I mean, I'm supposed to grow older and become more dignified and more attractive to younger women, and, right. and older women are supposed to be marginalized in society and become yeah. more sedentary. Yet you talk about all kinds of strange things happening to men right. that uh, are contrary to that yes, traditional notion. Yes, it's really notion. quite upside down uh, at, uh, at this stage in our uh, evolution. I think women have had to change over the last two decades, and men haven't. And I think they're a little envious now. And I see glimmers of uh, real attempts for, to change, to redefine masculinity, starting right from the basics. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that amazed me was that um, when I put out a call in one city after another around the states, would groups of men come together and speak about things like middle age and the unspeakable passage, male menopause? And they would come out, 8 and 10 and 15 and 20 men, strangers to one another, and sit there talking about this stuff. Uh, they wanted validation that what they were experiencing was not some failing of their own, but that it was, you know, a predictable state of being, mm -hmm. and that there was something on the other side of it that they could go over the hump. What do you think that is? Because we're redefining maleness. There's new criteria. What it means to be a real man now, and men are having hard time coming to grips with that change. I think we are very much so doing that because you know what the, the major criteria used to be physical strength. Now jobs no longer depend on physical strength and uh, the, those kinds of formerly brawn-based jobs are mm -hmm. shrinking and brain-based jobs are expanding. So brain-based jobs are equally done by males or females. 
Um, and also, um, <clears throat> you know, men and their relationship to children is changing. And sure. younger men are finding that it's really wonderful to be, you know, to get all the bennies that go along with being um, looked up to as a parent. And you see them walking through airports, young men with children on their shoulders. It's like a new animal form. Yeah, but, but most males aren't really socialized to deal with these new things. I always say, you know, I'd love to spend more time with my family and can't understand why they don't want to watch golf with me on Sunday afternoon. We don't have many of these tools to deal with uh, the, the, the new demands. But I'm, I'm really interested in this, what you have called the unspeakable passage, this notion that there is a male menopause. I mean, do you mean that literally? I mean, female menopause, which you've also written a book on. I mean, mm -hmm. there's hormonal changes that are documentable and scientifically rooted. Is, do men go through something that's kind of similar? Well, it's a misnomer because men's um, ovarian function or the equivalent thereof doesn't all shut down mm -hmm. roughly at the same age. However, there are hormonal changes. They're more gradual and they happen a little bit later. But there's more to it than that. It's a real mind-body syndrome. And it's basically a lapse in vitality and virility and a decline in well-being that many men begin to experience, catches up with them usually in their 50s or maybe their 60s. And it's made up of some of the things we've already talked about. No longer feeling challenged by their work, repeating themselves. Um, first, um, physical kind of blowouts um, and then not paying attention to them, not taking care of it so that they may have, you know, blockages in blood flow and oxygen flow. Then they may have um, a sexual failure and then they get freaked out about it. And then that becomes uh, kind of institutionalized and they begin to no longer have desire because they're too fearful to have desire. And gradually they begin to just retreat from a lot of things that used to give them pleasure. Once male menopause really gets hold, it's, it's difficult to reverse. It's much easier to prevent. And the best way to prevent it is to know some of those early signs so that you can de delay it. Uh, so you've got my attention it. now. How, how? How do you delay? Well, the first thing is if there are any signs about uh, decreased blood flow, uh, oxygen flow, or overeating, and so on, you know, going to a doctor and, you know, really seriously changing your diet and exercising and so on. Because after all, anything that decreases the blood flow to your heart is also going to decrease the blood flow to your sexual organs. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make it more difficult. Um, the, the whole, you know, doing, changing what you do if what you're doing is, uh, is, is boring you, is putting you to sleep. Um, reintroducing risk in your life, very important. Um, having a trusted mate, really important for men, more important for men in middle life than women. Um, one of the, the uh, surveys that I did was with Harvard Business School men, mm -hmm. and I followed them when they were 45 all the way, 55 and then 65. When they were 55, the difference between those who had the highest well-being on this scale that I used and the lowest were, the highest were the presidents and the lowest were the vice presidents. And it was all about status and jockeying for position. When they were 65, it was totally different. Hmm. Um, those, the, the real measurement was not their income level, their net worth, or their job status. The highest well-being men were those who had found mature love. Sounds sappy, maybe, but they had found real companionship, trust, intimacy, um, relaxation, safety with their mates. Um, and often it was with the first wife. Now compared to men, you're talking about women having a lot to look forward to in middle essence and, uh, and, and later older age. I mean, you talk about a can-do sense that mm -hmm. takes hold of, uh, of women and invigorates them. Well, I see women as moving into the flaming 50s. Uh, and uh, they see it that way too. The, so many that I've interviewed are going back to school, taking graduate degrees, uh, starting their own businesses. Um, going off to, uh, you know, be kind of minor league Mother Teresa's, um, all kinds of new endeavors that are extremely exciting to them. And not only that, I find that women over 50 that I've interviewed, at least half of them, are more sexually adventurous than they were in first adulthood. Why are a lot of these changes seen to be ad adventures and exciting for women and, and potentially, you know, uh, unsettling for men? 
Well, because women have pretty much been in conflict in first adulthood about career versus family, about personal expression versus pleasing others. And I see the basic movement for women in the Flaming Fifties as from pleasing to mastery. Mm -hmm. And the sense of exhilaration as they master their environment uh, and more and more skills and possibilities uh, become uh, actually actualized, it's very exciting. Whereas men are much more likely to be doing the same thing or hanging on to it and not really wanting to make a passage, just holding on to what they have till something blasts them out of it. Now, you're best known for, obviously, the studies that you've done in uh, adult development and also these in-depth psychological profiles of, of leaders and, and politics. And in looking at your body of work, I mean, it struck me as that while we go through individual passages, uh, they obviously have an implication for societal values and societal be behavior. I mean, I'd be interested whether you thought much about the linkage between the societal work you've done and kind of the political work. I mean, given the passages that we're going through collectively now as a society, mm -hmm. does that say anything about political choice and the kind of political leadership that mm -hmm. we're looking at for now that perhaps would be different in the past? Well, I think so. I think um, Bill Clinton um, actually represents very much his own generation. The big generation. Yeah. And his style of leadership, which is a consensus style, you know, kind of the endless seminar and always mm -hmm. inviting, you know, the next opinion and asking everybody what they think, taking it all, and never quite arriving at a definitive situation and never, you know, standing up there like the commander and saying, this is the way it's going to be and this is your position, your position, your position. It just isn't his style. Well, the society hasn't really caught on to that yet. We feel, we feel very uncomfortable with that in the States. Weak, perhaps. Uh, it seems like it translates into weakness, yeah. and we're never quite you know, sure where we stand. Some of it is his own uh, personality needs to please everybody. But then along comes somebody like Newt Gingrich, and he goes back, even though he's only 52, he uh, leads with the totally World War II generation mm -hmm. style. Top-down, hierarchical, you do this, you do that, you take that island, you take that island, and I'm over here. Um, and all of his heroes are John Wayne and, and World Franklin War II. Franklin Delano heroes. Roosevelt. Yeah. I mean. And people seem to be, you know, liking it, but also resisting it, because we have moved beyond wanting to have hierarchical forms mm -hmm. of leadership in our companies as well right. as in our, in our political life. Right. But, but I mean, if, if society has a character, and the character is shaped by, by our passages, mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of leadership do they want? Now, do they want a Bill Clinton consensual kind of watch me play my saxophone on <laughs> Arsenio Hall, or do they want a Newt Gingrich who says, this is the way we're going to do it, we're going to put those orphans into homes, and Bob's your uncle, that'll reduce our welfare payments. I think we're schizophrenic at this point. We want a little bit of both, and that's why we're probably going to have divided leadership for some time, because huh. we're in between the shift from one generational style to another. Yeah, you have not been a stranger to controversy y yourself in terms of you know, your craft and, uh, and what you've written about and, and the particular manner in which you've written. I mean, as a best-selling author, you obviously have power and influence. I read your books and say, hmm, I'm going through middle essence. Uh, <laughs> you know, you read it, do an in-depth profile on Jesse Jackson that says something about his brother, and, you know, that says a lot that wasn't there there before. Mm -hmm. Yet, because of the very approach you, you've taken, which is, you know, psychological profiles and very kind of, you know, in-depth studies of society, a lot of the work that you're, you're doing is by its nature supposition. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't empirically say, this is how someone's going to govern because of this character, whatever. I mean, how do you balance ethically the kind of the influence and power you have by your popularity and, and the approach that, that you've, you've adopted in, in the lion's share of your work that, that you are going to suppose a lot of things? Well, I think that um, traditional political journalists um, make tremendous suppositions. Mm -hmm. They look at, uh, you know, they take the, the past polls and they figure out how people have voted before in voting blocks and they say, you know, they follow the horse race and they say this is the winner or this is the handicap and this is a song. They may or may not be right, but it influences a lot of people. Um, I just come at it in a different view and I say, here is another aspect that I think you need to be aware of. You need to be aware of the pattern of this person's character. And, and so I'm, it's quite different to analyze polls to analyze someone's character. I mean, that comes much closer to Yes, it does, and it bone. makes people uncomfortable mm -hmm. sometimes. But I try not to make hard and fast judgments. I try to say, let me lay it out. Let's take a look at, from stage to stage at how this person has been formed. 
and what's been the kind of behavior pattern of response to life accidents, say, to failure, um, to competition, to is this an honest person? Is this a person mm -hmm. who seems to know himself or herself? Um, what do all the people that have been close to him or her say uh, that, that, that gives you a theme, that gives you a, a through line? Um, because that's probably going to continue to be so. Or maybe there's been some point at which that person has really taken a leap of growth, uh, reinvented himself or herself. And if that's so, let's look at that. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's just an important part of the mix that we need to know before we, we uh, because we're, we often idealize somebody, then we get them into power, and then we become totally disenchanted because the idealization doesn't come true. For sure, for sure. Now, when you, when you wrote passages in 1976, I think. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. you hardly worried about people who were in their 50s. And 20 years ago, heaven knows we didn't. And, and now you've right. written a book that really does focus on, on people in their, in, their, in their 50s. In 20, and 60s and, and 70s. And 60s and 70s. Yeah. And, that, but as this and group, 40s. <laughs> as this group ages, you know, in 20, 20 years' time, is the, the Gail Sheehy New Passages 2. I mean, when you look at three, uh, three, three, three <laughs> new passages, new passages, newer passages, right. uh, what could we look forward to? I mean, speculate a little bit for me on, you know, what, what our society will be like where 70-year-olds are, are, the, are the norm. Have you started thinking that far ahead now? Well, I don't, uh, I, I, you know, I would have been totally wrong if I tried to predict where we were 20 years mm -hmm. ago. Um, because I thought at that time, 20 years ago, 50 was old. Right. No, it's, 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 it is a new beginning for many people. So I would imagine, since we have broken the evolutionary code, since neuroscientists now say it may be that we, there is no finite limit to the adult human life cycle. And that's a pretty terrifying proposition. It certainly is. Uh, and if that's so, maybe when we're 70, for some people, that may be only you know, two-thirds of the way through. They're already predicting that among the baby boom generation, at least a million will pass 100. Now, that's a whole different calculation um, of how you stretch out your life, how, sure. you, how you live your life, how you live your life, how you manage your resources, um, how you keep coming up with uh, new dreams and uh, mm -hmm. new, new ways of uh, being excited about life. But, but the one thing that you can't stop, even if you prolong it, is the you know, inevitable deterioration. Well, we um, may uh, be um, able to, uh, to, to delay that, too, because, you know, having mapped all the genes now, we're, they're now talking about, you know, maintenance and not just replacement of organs, but regeneration of organs. So we may go in and kind of get, you know, like a, a lube job. <laughs> It's <laughs> an interesting notion. <laughs> so I should be topping up my RRSPs big time to count on retirement Definitely. of going 40 or 50 years. I just saw a study, I thought it would be interesting in your reaction, that really, really surprised me. And the study was starting on to look at generations. So they tapped a number of questions in survey research that you would think there would be huge generational differences. And then what they found was, and this is in Canada, that there was hardly any difference among the generations on a lot of questions like how concerned are you about health and the prospect of dying, how spiritual, you know, and, and what you found is that almost the entire society was starting to hold big generation values. As mm -hmm. the big generation was getting older, younger people were almost as concerned about the prospect of dying in their health as 70 year, year, year olds. Yeah. I mean, are, are, we, are we becoming more monolithic in our value systems as a consequence of this tremendous influence of this big bunch in the population? Well, I think that the boomers will redefine, are redefining middle life. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. And since boomers will never define themselves as failures, they will just redefine the measures of success. And since there are too many of them to define success by getting to the top of their particular career pyramid, they will f find many other ways of defining success, such as starting second families or you know becoming engaged uh, parents or fathers at a, at a later age or uh, being involved members of their community, or artistic forms of artistic expression that may or may not be their mainstay of their income. Uh, there will be many different forms in which uh, middle essence will express success that, that is not getting to the top of your career pyramid. 